And welcome to the Cambridge Union tonight. Um, it's a nice and cosy crowd that we have in front of us. Um, so yeah, the, the way I thought it'd go is I'm just going to ask uh, Michael some questions and then uh, feel free to sort of stick your hand up if you sort of have any questions as we go along. Um, but where I wanted to start is, you know, you're an Oxford man um, and we're all Cambridge students um, and I study politics here and I remember my first lecture uh, my lecturer asked us to put up their hands and he said, you know, who in this room wants to study politics? Who, who wants to be an MP, to study politics to be an MP? Um, and very few people put up their hands and he laughed and he said, you know, if he'd asked the same question in Oxford to a, stu to a sort of bunch of PPE students, it would have been very different. Um, and now as a student of PPE and somebody whose contemporaries have sort of gone on into government, etc., is PPE the school of politics, I, I, the, the sort of the subject of government? Uh, well, I, I suppose... Increasingly, it is. I mean, we have a, a pri not only a prime minister who studied PPE, uh, the former leader of the Labour Party, Ed Miliband uh, studied PPE, Ed Balls. Um, it's, it's much more of the, the subject of government than it was uh, even when I studied it uh, 40 years ago. Um, and um, in a way, I wish rather fewer people would study it. <laughs> Uh, and my own daughter studied it as well, although she concentrated on the, the philosophy and the economics rather than the, the politics bit, which was my uh, kind of thing. It's, uh, I think it is a touch unhealthy that there are so many PPEists uh, in the higher echelons of, um, uh, of government and politics uh, and the media. And I always think uh, rather more of somebody if I hear that they've studied history or even you know, something unusual for a political background like science. Or um, uh, I mean, it isn't actually a requirement that you should have uh, studied uh, PPE, and I think it's uh, quite healthy for our um, political system if people actually have done something um, rather different. And you could say, well, the economics is useful, but frankly, uh, the PPE course uh, at Oxford has, y you're only actually going to be doing two or three, max, well, yeah, I suppose you might do five, but most people don't do enough economics uh, to really be able to call themselves <laughs> economists. <laughs> Certainly, I would never pretend to be an economist <laughs> on the basis of my two two papers uh, out of eight. And uh, now you've got what here, social and political sciences you have here. The name changes constantly. Yeah, but, which, my, yeah. which my nephew, who was president here 10 years ago, uh, he, he studied, and I suppose is the equivalent, although you don't quite have the philosophy bit, do you? No, and, and uh, a starkly less of us go into, into politics. Um, most of us sort of, a route to, that we take is into journalism, mm. uh, which is one you took. So why just sort of did you go down the political journalist rather than sort of well, I always saw journalism as, as just a sort of um, something to keep me uh, employed before I went into politics. Hmm. I mean, I always intended, um, when I was at Oxford, I was involved in both student journalism, and I was editor of Charwell, the university newspaper, and involved in politics there. Um, and I, I intended to uh, just be a journalist for 10 or 15 years, and then I hoped that uh, somebody would choose me uh, for a seat. And I was a Labour Party member and a Labour supporter. Uh, in those days, I'm not that anymore. I'm, uh, I'm now totally neutral, and I generally am neutral. Uh, I don't vote in elections, and I don't even know how I would vote if there was an election uh, tomorrow. But, uh, and then what happened was, in 1990, I had been a uh, correspondent for Channel 4 News in Washington, um, and I'd sort of put out some feelers to the Labour Party, saying, I'm coming back. Um, can I fight a, um, a hopeless seat? And um, a few weeks later, once I'd got back to England, um, a couple of senior people in the Labour Party said, well, there's this by-election in Bootle on Merseyside, um, which was the safest Labour seat in England at the time. It may be, it still is, I don't know. And uh, we, we're looking for a candidate that isn't militant. By militant, they meant the militant tendency, was, which was a Trotskyist group, uh, which had infiltrated the Labour Party in the 1980s, and about which I'd written a book uh, which has actually just been reprinted, was reprinted and came out on Friday. Um, but uh, there's the plug. But the, um, <laughs> anyway, they wanted somebody who was notably not militant. And they said, well, uh, you know, can you, uh, are you interested in standing? Uh, these two very senior people in the Labour Party in the North West. But they must, you must tell us by tomorrow night. And so uh, I discussed it with my uh, then wife. And uh, she didn't really fancy going to live on uh, Merseyside. But she'd lived there in her earlier years. And, um, and I knew it would be difficult being a Manchester United supporter uh, uh, standing in a, in a Merseyside seat. Um, but these were all excuses, really. And I actually had decided that I, I didn't really want to make the move. And I knew that if I didn't go for Bootle, I wasn't really going to go for anywhere. 
And since then, I've felt utterly liberated. Uh, my commitment to the Labour Party evaporated a long time ago. Um, and uh, I've actually been a much better journalist as a result. Because in, during the 1980s, when I was a pretty junior journalist on, in, in ITN, uh, I was constantly thinking, well, how will this play in terms of my political career? Which is an awful thing to, to happen. Uh, and, to, and, and as a result, I'm always slightly suspicious, I'm afraid to say, of colleagues in television who express a desire to go into politics. Because although I do think that more people should go into politics and it's healthy and so on, you always wonder about where their true commitment lies. Does it lie to the party they ultimately hope to represent, or does it lie to uh, our work as journalists, which of course is, uh, involves holding all of these uh, people to account. So uh, since then, um, I've been a, a full-time, non-stop journalist. Have I regretted it? Occasionally. Actually, my generation, the people who went through Oxford and Cambridge and all the other universities in the late 70s, has been remarkably unsuccessful in politics. I mean, with the exception, I mean, from the people who were at Oxford with me, um, William Hay came up in the term I was president of the union, and I gave him his first speech in the union. Obviously, he's a huge exception. Theresa May was the returning officer of the Oxford Union elections, having not got anywhere in union elections <laughs> herself. Um, and she would have been the last, per virtually the last person in Oxford that anybody would have predicted uh, would reach one of the highest offices. <laughs> and apart from that, you're talking about Benazir Bhutto. Very few of my contemporaries, they really reached the highest levels. They all sort of got to the fringes of the cabinet. People like Alan Duncan and D Damien Green and Dominic Grieve. Um, and on this side, um, Andrew Mitchell was all sort of, well, he was in the cabinet, but... Um, uh, his career didn't go as high as, as he'd hoped, although he's still plugging away. Um, and, um, and again, that, that Cambridge generation from the late 70s, apart from Andrew Mitchell, I can't think of... Oh, and David Liddington, who I just noticed on one of the Union photos. It wasn't... It hasn't been a, a great... There was something about the late 70s that, uh, you know, the world passed us by. Whereas when it came to the 80s, in, certainly in Oxford terms, you've got well, the two big stars of, uh, of the Leave campaign. You've got uh, Michael Gove and... Boris Johnson. Sorry, no. I'm rabbiting on no, far no. too long. No, and Josh, you must promise me yes. that if I don't answer your questions, you will tell me and sure. insist that I do. Um, well, I just want to pick you up then on something you said about you know holding yeah. your, your role is to hold sort of these people to account. Um, and very recently, you wrote about the sort of the Tory expenses in Thanet South. Um, yeah. And I don't know if anybody sort of here knows about that, so maybe you could just tell them a bit about that. Well, we're doing more on that, yeah. But also, sort of that this is an ongoing story, one developing. Yeah. But you sort of wrote at the end of one of your articles that it's a really sort of important issue going forward. Um, I wouldn't have used the phrase going forward. An, an, impo <laughs> an, an important issue. Um, but but yeah. why for you is this such an important issue? I don't know. It's become one of the... I mean, I, I, I think as a journalist, you do have certain things, subjects you're interested in. And I'm, I'm a sort of quite an obsessive person, so I have what my critics would say are obsessions, and indeed they are. And this is... I remember 30 years ago in a by-election having dinner with a, uh, a colleague and a liberal, a liberal as it was then, agent, who said, well, the thing about these by-elections is everybody fiddles their expense limits. They all spend a lot more than they're allowed to. And I thought, gosh, this is an amazing story, if that's true. Um, why does nobody ever report this? And I sort of, you know, bore it in mind for, uh, uh, well, until 1997, when in the lead-up to the 1997 election, Labour spent masses of money trying to win by-elections when Blair was about to become Prime Minister. And, of course, in those days, Labour had lots of money. Um, and, uh, I mean, I was subsequently told that on the Wirral South by-election, they spent half a million pounds when the legal limit then, I think, I think, was 30,000 pounds. So they, you know, they spent 20 times as much as they should. And the Liberals, so the Liberals were at it, Labour were at it, and now, more recently, the Conservatives have been at it. And what clearly happened in the three by-election, big by-elections in 2014 is that the Conservatives were desperate to stop UKIP making any progress, and they were desperate to stop them getting their first MP. Failed, of course. Um, and so they threw everything at these by-elections, uh, broke all the rules, uh, and then they did the same in the general election in certain seats, notably South Thanet. And um, we're going to be doing some more on South Thanet in the next few days. Um, and... Um, the, uh, they were desperate to stop Nigel Farage becoming an MP uh, and becoming, they feared, I suppose, an effective leader in the Commons. And, of course, in the general election, now the limit is only 15,000. Well, I mean, we've already shown that the Conservatives spent 30,000 there, and it's probably a lot more. The reason why this is important, the reason why we have expense limits in this country, in elections, in parliamentary elections, 
is to create a, something of a level playing field um, and so that money doesn't dominate our politics in the way that it does in America. The problem you have right now is that um, uh, you have one very rich party. I mean, the Conservative Party is probably richer than it's ever been because people see it as a successful party of government uh, and likely to remain so for 10 Year, 10, 20 years, the way the Labour Party is at the moment, whereas the Labour Party is really lacking money, a lot of its business donors and Jewish donors have deserted the party, union funds are uh, in short supply, the Liberal Democrats have got no money, UKIP's got no money, the SNP are quite rich, but of course that only affects a part of the, uh, the, the, of the kingdom. So um, it, is, it is actually an important issue of principle, and I think that if politicians are actually breaking the law to get elected in the first place, and that's what we're talking about here, um, they do actually sign a form saying, I certify that that's what I've spent and nothing else. Uh, if they're breaking the law to get elected, well, I think that's quite serious. But maybe I'm in a minority... Well, I know I'm not in a minority of one because I've got half a dozen <laughs> colleagues working on this story. But maybe we're in a minority of six or seven. But anyway, I think journalists have to carry on uh, at their obsessions and at the things where initially the rest of the world thinks they're mad. And it seems maybe not much has changed since the days in the Oxford Union elections, but <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so just to sort of move on then. The highest um, office that money can buy. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah, yeah. um, to, to move on then to, to Europe, you've spoken yeah. very quickly about this sort of in-out referendum. Um, and my feeling on it, and I don't know whether this is your share or if yeah. people in the room will share, is that, you know, our decisions will be made about what the press say. You know, it's very hard for us to sort of understand the, I think it's a 37-page document or whatever about the sort of the deal. Um, so it, it, it's sort of wherever we take uh, our, our, our news from, that will help us sort of uh, reach our decision on whether we should stay in, whether we should stay out. And I just wanted to know what your sort of feeling about the role of the media is and sort of important uh, political decisions like this to sort of help inform the, the public consensus. Well, well, clearly we have a, uh, a major role when it comes to any kind of, uh, voting, uh, in, you know, be it a referendum or a, an election, in uh, distilling information and uh, and regurgitating it for the the general public, uh, and that, that you know, holding politicians to account is one of our duties. But another of our duties is trying to explain what everything's all about. And of course, when it comes to the European referendum, that is exceedingly difficult. Um, it worked in Scotland, actually. Uh, I mean, when I covered the Scotland referendum, I was astonished at just how incredibly well-informed mm. uh, voters were there. At the moment, uh, one doesn't feel that voters here are that well-informed, or indeed the politicians, or indeed us journalists are, are that well-informed. Let's hope. We've got another three months of this, um, uh, more than three months, so let's hope uh, things improve. Uh, you talked about the press. It's... Um, I mean, the press actually, I by that, I assume you mean the media as a whole. Yeah. Uh, I mean, after all, the press in terms of newspapers are in, in rapid decline. Uh, on the other hand, we do have a thriving um, uh, online, uh, there's thriving online activity, and uh, broadcasters and, and, and radio stations are still uh, extremely uh, strong. So I think there will be uh, a far, far better debate in uh, 2016, uh, in this referendum, than I remember from the referendum in 1975 when I actually, you know, as a teenager, was out campaigning. Um, I can't even remember which... No, I was on the uh, Stay in Europe side. <laughs> um, but um, uh, that... I remember very little about that referendum, apart from a big debate at the Oxford Union. Um, I think um, this is going to be taken a lot more seriously, and I think the people who voted this referendum are actually going to be better informed. And actually, I think that probably voters in all elections um, are better informed now than they ever have been in our history. I mean, we, we, all meet, we, we, we all meet people who, of course, are incredibly ignorant or don't care, and, of course, lots of people don't vote. Um, but um, I think overall, given that now we now live in a world where people's votes are no longer determined by their class or their background or their family, a lot less by their family, people are much more promiscuous in the way they vote. I think inevitably uh, people are, do go out of their way to get a bit better informed and uh, people are uh, better informed even though they probably uh, are much more but likely to vote in some talent contest than they are in... What's caused this? Is this sort of the changing nature of, of, of media, the idea that it's sort of more accessible, it's sort of just or only at a click of a button away? Well, I mean all sorts of different things are going on here but and uh, uh, you know, in terms of traditional measures of political involvement, 
uh, we're, you know, at, a, at an all-time low. Fewer people are actually members of uh, political parties than, than, than ever. I mean, it's down to about 100,000 uh, Conservatives. Labour's gone up, of course, because everybody wanted to vote in the leadership election. The Liberal Democrats are at a, at a very low figure, although it's gone up a, a bit. SNP are doing all right. But overall, the numbers of people who belong to political parties is, is very low indeed. Turnout in elections, again, is, is, is pretty, pretty dismal. Um, but I think that the, the number of different ways that you can uh, receive your politics, it, you know, I mean, if you take 50 years ago, um, when the BBC didn't cover elections at all, 60 years ago, uh, the, only, the only means people had of finding out about what was going on was newspapers. Um, and, and now you've got all the different media, including all the online stuff, which of course is hugely important to people um, of, of your generation. Uh, in a way that it isn't for people of my, uh, much less important for people of my generation, and the ability for hundreds of thousands of people to get personally involved, as they do do in Twitter and online and Facebook and, and all the different uh, uh, on, online systems there are, much of which I, I, I barely understand, I admit. Um, and I just think there is a, uh, actually there are probably more people involved if you take it in its widest sense quite apart from all the protest groups mm. and campaign groups uh, that there are around the place. I think there actually are more people involved in politics uh, than ever before. I think actually, so it's promising from that point of view, just that by the traditional measures, turnout and party membership, it, it looks pretty bad. But I mean, have you yourself sort of found it a struggle? You've been in the business for a long time now, and when you started, it was very different. But sort of, I think when Jeremy Vine was here, he sort of laboured the point that if a journalist is not sort of on Twitter or on Facebook, etc., they become very out of touch with their, their, their readership. Um, and have you found that sort of a struggle to, to keep up to the sort of the ever-changing way? Well, I'm, I, I just deal with Twitter, and I'm a Twitter obsessive. <laughs> I don't do Facebook. I can't do more than one of these things, and so I've chosen to do Twitter. And, um, uh, you know, I look at Twitter many times a day, and I tweet. Uh, some days I don't tweet at all. I don't... I, I've barely done anything today, for instance. Um, but, um, uh, but, I mean, there are some colleagues who do all of these different... And then, what, what's the thing, WhatsApp or something? I don't even know what WhatsApp is. But, I mean, I, I, and Facebook, I've never done that, really. I, mean, I am on Facebook, but it's more, more um, sort of a family thing. Um, and, uh, but I think it's great, because it means that if I get a little story, you know, if somebody texts me or tips me off while I'm coming on the train tonight... I can immediately, uh, providing I know it's accurate, I can immediately uh, tweet about it. it. Whereas in the past, I only had this one seven o'clock outlet, and generally it had to be something pretty meaty to get on. Whereas now, I've got this opportunity to not only put out little stories or little additions to stories I've done on air, but then I also can get feedback and get a feel, I get a feed from feedback of what people are saying. Now, you've got to be careful, because I don't think a, a Twitter audience or indeed probably the audience on any of these other uh, media is, uh, is necessarily typical of the public as a whole. I think some journalists make that mistake, that they suddenly get 30 people telling them what wankers they are after something they've said. They mustn't, uh, you mustn't assume that that's what the public as a whole thinks. Um, and, um, and, of course, the other great thing is that that's where you pick up your news from now. If a story breaks, it will be on Twitter first, whereas traditionally, journalists used to work through wire services that came through, well, originally, they used to come through on telex machines and bits of paper, and then they came through um, online. And, and now the wire services are very slow compared with Twitter. So you've got to keep your, keep your eye constantly on what's going on, Twitter and the other, the other services that some of my colleagues use, just to, just to get the latest stories. But it's a hell of a lot more exciting as a journalist to have all of this. And, and also, because you're going around with your iPhone, you can <laughs> be check it where you're in the street or in a taxi or on the train. Um, I mean, this is... I mean, I know this is all everyday life for all of you, but I tell you, 10, 20 years ago, we had none of this, you know. I mean, it was, it was, it was basically the newspapers in the morning, and then you kept an eye on the radio and television bulletins. So how now, then, does this sort of the job for the political journalist work? How do you go about sort of getting your stories? Do they come to you, or do you have to sort of actively go out and ring up these people and chase various leads, etc.? Well, um, you, a lot of it, you're following up stories that have been in the papers uh, that day. So, for instance, I wasn't working today because I was coming here. I, I, well, I have been working, but I haven't been working properly. Um, and so, you know, this morning, uh, you know, one of the stories I would have followed up this morning, John Longworth, the uh, Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, he, you know, resigned over the weekend. Big question, did he resign? Was he pushed 
by BCC, almost certainly. Was he pushed by Downing Street? Well, that's the interesting question. So, I mean, the first thing I would have done this morning is ring him up. Now, as it happens, I interviewed him on Thursday, got him to express anti, uh, got him to express his Brexit views, which are contrary to most members, although not all members of the BCC. And after the interview on Thursday, I asked him if I could have his mobile number because I didn't have it. Uh, and um, so now it's in my system, <laughs> so I now would have been equipped to ring him up. So that would have, that's how I would have started the day. And you generally you start the day following things up. Because I'm a tr um, accredited to the House of Commons, I try and go across there once a day, um, and you wander around, and people talk to you about all sorts. Generally, you go across to the Commons hoping to speak to people about one story, and they, they then bombard you uh, with others. Oh, another thing that happened today, this morning. I mean, this has been a good day for a day where I've yeah. not been working. Uh, I was sitting in a cafe at 9 o'clock this morning, catching up with my um, 9.15 this morning, and a man came up to me and um, told me a story about Boris Johnson uh, that he insisted I should follow up. Um, <laughs> and it sounded rather promising. Uh, and indeed, I will follow it up. Are we allowed uh, an insight into the story? So, so, you know, and I get a lot of that. You get, you get a lot of people... <laughs> sorry? I said, are we allowed an insight into the story? No, because there'll be some student journalists <laughs> <laughs> in this audience. <laughs> I hope you'll be able to see it on Channel 4 News. Uh, uh, it, uh, it involves uh, property development, so we put it yeah. um, And as you would imagine from an architect, um, I mean, this is all part of the great fun of it. People and people, um, and then people are constantly emailing or even tweeting, saying, well, "Why aren't you covering this story?" And um, Paul Foot, who was one of the greatest uh, journalists in British history, who used to uh, he died what five years ago, and used to do the in the back section of Private Eye. Uh, you know, he would be bombarded with people writing in, when sending him stuff in brown envelopes. And he always used to say, listen to the nutters. <laughs> um, because the nutters, actually, they may sound nutty, but if you listen to them and read what they have to say, often um, it turns out uh, that there's something, that, you know, often there is something in, in their stories. The trouble is you have to do a lot of listening and a lot of reading to disentangle um, uh, what's, uh, you know, the, 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 not, the, real, the genuine, you know, sometimes you just, people are paranoid. I mean, I, I've had various people stalking me, insisting that they're being, you know, uh, watched from <laughs> helicopters uh, by the security services and so on. So, um, but I live in constant fear that one day somebody will say, you know, there'll be some massive, uh, you know, international scandal or national scandal, and the person at the center of it will say, well, you know, it's a... Uh, and somebody will say, well, why is it taking so long for this story to get out? And they'll say, um, uh, oh, well, you know, I did take my story elsewhere. I remember I took my story to Michael Crick at Channel 4 News, and he just ignored me. Very <laughs> rude he was as well. Um, <laughs> and that's why I had to go to Newsnight in the end. Um, so you've got to... But on the other hand, you can't, you can't do everything at once, and so you have to make quick judgments and, and assessments. And so, um, and a lot of the time, I'm just doing what the office tells me to do, and a lot of my time is, is, is basic daily output. Um, and you've got no option but to, um, uh, you know, you've got to do, there are certain stories of the day that as a political correspondent you have to do. We don't have vast numbers of staff uh, that can suddenly step in if I'm doing a long-term uh, investigation. Hmm. Wonderful. Well, uh, we will open it up to the audience there. Does anybody have any questions? Um, yeah, we've just got one at the front here. Since we don't have too many people, I'm going to beg your indulgence and ask three questions, if that's all right. <laughs> or, or two. That's um, great. Um, that's my rule. You never ask, only ask one. I, I always think it's mad at Downing Street press conferences say that journalists ask more than one question. No, sorry, I'm being very rude here. <laughs> no, but you see, if you ask one question, that puts me on the spot because I can only answer that one. Whereas if you ask three questions, I'll deal with the easiest one first and then the second easiest one second. And by then, I hope that everyone will have, will have forgotten the hard one and I won't, be able, I won't answer that one at all. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll only ask one there. <laughs> um, well, t one at a bit. Uh, I first came across your work um, soon after I read First Among Equals and then I read Stranger Than Fiction. Um, I was wondering what put you on to Lord Archer and how your journey with him progressed. And secondly, whether you think there's a certain predilection for Oxford-educated Tories to admire themselves in scandal more than Cambridge ones, thinking about Lord Archer and uh, Jonathan Aitken and why Cambridge has been less admired in scandal. Well, um, let's deal with easy... <laughs> well, of course, there, there, are, there are a lot fewer, uh, as, uh, as Josh was pointing out, a lot fewer politicians from Cambridge um, have, um, but I'm sure if we uh, think about it a little bit more, we can find, well, Greville Janner, for instance, 
uh, was indeed president of the uh, Cambridge Union, I think in about 1954. Uh, not a conservative politician, although some of his Labour, Labour colleagues would have said he was. <laughs> um, but um, he was, uh, we, it's not a, we shouldn't, I shouldn't joke about it, but I mean, he, he, he uh, was a, uh, you know, very serious, I mean, all sorts of terrible allegations came out about him um, uh, and have done over the last few years. And of course, he died um, a few weeks ago. Uh, I don't think there's anything about, you know, Oxford or Cambridge. I mean, if I was being partisan about this, I'd say, well, you know, what about the Cambridge spies? Um, but the, um, in terms of Archer, um, the, uh, I'd, I'd always, um, I remember when I was about, what, 13? Um, my father, I came down one Saturday morning, and my father, I wrote a book about Geoffrey Archer, which came out 20 years ago, um, and my, uh, a biography of him, and my first interest in it was when I was a as I say, about 13, in about 1971. And there was a big profile of him by Terry Coleman in The Guardian. And um, my father said to me, oh, you must read that profile of this Tory MP. Uh, he's, uh, he's clearly a crook, and he spends his life uh, raising money for charities. Um, and I read this uh, um, uh, profile, and it was full of the extraordinary things that Archer had done by that stage. I mean, at that stage, Archer was only about 31. And, you know, he'd done things like... Um, uh, getting the Beatles involved in an Oxfam campaign while he was at Oxford, going to the White House and meeting uh, President Johnson while he was an Oxford student, uh, raising lots of money for charities and then taking 10%, which actually was rather frowned on in those days. It's regarded as natural these days. So I, I had it constantly in my mind, and then years and years later, 20 years later, um, I happened to be uh, uh, in the Tate Gallery having lunch, and by coincidence, sitting at the next table was my literary agent. And we, we, so we said goodbye to our own guests and wandered out together. And he looked across the road and he said, and towards Archer's flat, and he said, you haven't, been, you haven't thought of writing a book about Geoffrey Archer, have you? And, um, uh, and I knew immediately it was, the, it was the one to do. It's the book that's been the most fun, um, and which, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's in three, three or four editions it went to. And I'm still working on little stories to do with him, actually, um, and watch this space. And um, the, um, uh, so, so, that, so that was the, I mean, the great thing about Archer was he wasn't just a, a political figure. I mean, politics was sort of a minority. It was, you know, the whole of his books, and he had so many other little careers. I mean, he was a policeman at one stage, and, he'd, and there was all the controversy about whether he'd really been at Oxford. Nothing was ever, ever straight with Archer. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there, there was always some extra story, some extra dishonesty. And of course, now he's gone to jail, for, went to jail for two years for perjury. I don't have to sit here worrying about um, <laughs> libeling him or slandering him um, in, a, in a meeting like this. Um, and yeah, we've got a question just up there. I didn't realize there were people up there. Is there anyone mic? Uh, just shout. Well, I think one of the reasons why Jeremy Corbyn is, elect is leader of the Labour Party is because uh, there's been a dearth of talent. Sorry, that's a bit of a cliche. There's been an absence of talent uh, in the Labour ranks. And um, the uh, Luciana Berger, I think, was one of your speakers earlier in the term. Yes, she was. Um, not Luciana Berger. Sorry, I'm get mixing her up with Liz Kendall. Sorry about that. Uh, Luciana <laughs> Berger, actually, keep an eye on her, but I don't think, I don't think it'll be her. At the moment, it looks like it's going to be... It uh, lo looks like da Dan Jarvis is the coming man. Um, who uh, has got an uh, interesting military background, only been an MP for, uh, for what, four years, um, and uh, rather tragically, uh, very tragically lost his wife a few years ago, which, has, which I think prevented him from um, standing against uh, Corbyn. I read, I read in The Guardian on, on Friday and Saturday that uh, he's, he's accepted a £16,000 donation from a hedge fund manager called, uh, hedge fund owner called, I uh, can't remember his first name, Taylor, I think is his surname. Uh, so clearly he's sort of uh, on manoeuvres, as, uh, as the phrase is, uh, as one would expect of a, of a military man. And I suppose he's the sort of figure that might uh, widen Labour's appeal um, well beyond its current um, constituency. The trouble is, um, uh, is how does the Labour Party get from, from here to there? I mean, you've still got a very... Uh, radical uh, membership uh, uh, who voted for Corbyn, 
And if Corbyn was to go under a bus or resign, would clearly uh, be likely to elect another left-wing um, leader. Um, on the other hand, under the Labour Party rules, it's the MPs who get to, uh, who, who have a sort of veto in that um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the candidate for the leadership, I think, needs 31 MPs. Anyway, uh, whatever it was. Anyway, Corbyn only just got it, and he only just got it because all sorts of people who didn't actually vote for him, MPs who didn't vote for him, decided to do so to widen the, uh, widen the choice. So um, the, the next Labour leadership election, if the, um, if the rules are not changed, is quite likely to involve a shortlist drawn up uh, by MPs who will be pe people on the centre and on the right um, and left-wingers will be excluded from that shortlist because they're not going to do that again. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but the electorate is likely to be um, the, the three, 400,000 Labour Party members and, and supporters who have shown themselves to be pretty left-wing and radical. But on the other hand, um, their views may change if uh, Labour is unsuccessful in elections. Um, and it all depends when, in, when any of this happens. I think the general rule, though, in leadership elections is that the winner is generally somebody that nobody could have predicted 18 months before, uh, particularly for opposition parties. And that rule works, pretty, works for about 75% of leadership elections of all political parties since the Second World War, um, and particularly uh, opposition parties. So the answer is, uh, if you put a gun to my head, I think uh, Dan Jarvis is probably your best bet, but if probably won't be him. It probably, probably won't even be him. So looking at the, at the, at the Conservative Party then, you know, um, David Cameron has obviously come yeah. out quite publicly in favour of staying in, um, but senior Conservative politicians, Boris Johnson, for example, has sort of come out um, quite clearly on the uh, exit side. Um, do you think Cameron could survive uh, in his leadership um, if if, if the vote sort of doesn't go his way and if the, the country decides to leave Europe? Definitely not. Uh, I mean, if, if the vote is uh, lost from Cameron's point yeah. of view, uh, I mean, even Ken Clark said some of this to me on camera. In fact, it's amazing it can get picked up, but I mean, Ken, former president here, uh, said to me on camera two or three weeks ago that, um, two weeks ago, that uh, it's very unlikely that Cameron could survive if he lost. My view, increasingly, is I'm not even sure he can survive for very much longer, even if, if he wins. Certainly, I think there has been um, an arrogance, uh, a heavy-handedness about the Downing Street government operation so far that has alienated many Conservative MPs. You've got to remember, I think, for most of Cameron's leadership, um, Cameron has not actually been very popular amongst his MPs. They, they sort of elected, they went along with him because they thought he was the best chance of getting elected. Um, but he's very, he can be very um, aloof and arrogant and heavy-handed with many of his backbenchers. And up until the election last year, that was certainly the feeling in the Parliamentary Party. They then all forgave him because they suddenly won this election unexpectedly. They suddenly got a, a majority, albeit a small one, but they didn't expect. They managed to get rid of the Liberal Democrats. Uh, there were a lot more jobs in government available because the Lib Dems were, were off. Um, and, um, and so he, he had a sort of nine-month honeymoon period. Now Cameron, I think, is in danger of alienating uh, a large number of his parliamentary party, uh, you know, half, nearly half of whom are, are supporting Brexit publicly, and probably the numbers who support Brexit privately is getting on for two-thirds. So I, I think, uh, whereas we all sort of were talking about Cameron stepping down in late 2019, I think even if he wins this vote, uh, it could well be next year or... It could well be pretty soon. But this vote, you know, this campaign has got three and a half months to mm. go. Uh, all sorts could happen between now and then. Um, and, um, but yeah, who do you see then like sort of lining up in the wings? Is, well, is Boris eyeing... The, the rule I just, you know, yeah. uh, said before that... Uh, uh, and it actually, it's, it's one of Ken Clark's rules that whoever wins the leadership is generally somebody you haven't predicted 18 months ahead. Mm, okay. Now, I, am, I suppose what I've been saying now is that actually this election could be less than 18 months ahead. And I suppose at the moment, Boris Johnson has got to be the overwhelming favourite. Um, and although actually he hasn't handled the last two or three weeks particularly well, in my view, and as uh, I think a lot of his colleagues regard him as a, a, a complete opportunist, and uh, he hasn't performed that well. But uh, there's a long time to go. Uh, but uh, as for May and Osborne, well, certainly, if, that, if, if it's lost, I think Osborne is, is sort of goes down with, uh, with Cameron because they're so 
so close. Uh, but I would, uh, I, I tried, uh, I, I'd looked down at the next level. I mean, Sajid Javid has got a great uh, uh, backstory, as they say, you know, the son of a Rochdale bus driver who was uh, bought, brought up above the shop, in, in, in his, his family shop in, uh, in Bristol, uh, obviously of, uh, you know, very successful city background, uh, ethnic minority, uh, totally, you know, didn't go to Eton or, uh, but he's not a very good performer. I mean, I, I was at the British Chambers of Commerce conference last week and he gave a dreadful performance uh, there. And uh, on the other hand, dreadful speakers do occasionally get elected <laughs> leader of the party. Priti Patel is, uh, uh, I think, is, who's uh, a, a middle-ranking employment minister uh, and, and, and quite uh, heavily involved in the Brexit campaign. I, I would, uh, I keep an eye on her if, uh, if I were you. Uh, but again, it, 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 there ain't lots of obvious choices mm. at the moment. But uh, you never know; somebody might suddenly re emerge at the last moment. I mean, look at how quickly Thatcher, Major, uh, emerged. Cameron himself emerged, mm. uh, and it's true on the Labour side as well. You know, these people are generally, they, generally, party leaders are not people that have been hot favourites for, for, for many decades. There's somebody who suddenly comes in at the last moment and nicks it. Uh, yeah, are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, we've got just one at the front here. Hi, um, you were speaking earlier about the work you've done on South Thanet in the constituency. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, is there any prospect of a by-election happening considering the year um, deadline hasn't occurred since the election? Um, well, and secondly, just with the Electoral Commission, do you think they should have more powers to be able to investigate these things? Definitely. Um, I mean, the Electoral Commission, um, which I regard as one of the most uh, useless institutions in British <laughs> public life, um, I mean, it's just, um, it, it's sort of, its culture is, is weak and its powers are weak. Um, and the trouble with this whole thing of election expenses, and I've explained why I think it's important, um, is that nobody really wants to police it. The, the local returning officers, they say, well, it's not our job to check the, uh, you know, you're, you're meant to submit uh, a return a month after the election saying how much money you spent, what you spent it on in details, with receipts, and where you got the money from. Um, but the local returning officers don't regard it as their job to check the returns. They just uh, take them in and then uh, allow people to come and look at them. Uh, the Electoral Commission say it's not our job to police uh, expenses returns, all we do is make sure that the national spending limits, which are a different matter, that the national spending limits are properly uh, observed. Uh, the police aren't interested, they always say, oh well, it's the returning officers and the electoral commission. So nobody really wants to have anything to do with this. Um, so it's absurd. But what's going on now is that following our report on South Thanet, the electoral commission, uh, and basically what we're saying is that the way the Conservatives got around these rules is that they claim that all sorts of areas of spending including £14,000 on a hotel, when the spending limit was only £15,000. <laughs> a hotel that included one of the uh, predecessors in that chair, Stephen, <laughs> Stephen Parkinson, stayed there, an uh, advisor to, at the time to Theresa May. Um, uh, that they, what they did is they claimed that this hotel was national expenditure, you know, on the national campaign. Uh, well, you know, why were all these people suddenly going down to Ramsgate, part of the South Thanet constituency, if they weren't actually campaigning against uh, Farage? Um, and um, so the Electoral Commission have got to decide whether the spending that appeared on the national spending returns was really local. And if it is local, they will then refer the matter to the Kent Police, who may well then investigate. But there's a 12-month limit on how, uh, how uh, uh, after which you can't be prosecuted for an electoral offence. You may think that's mad. It all stems from the 19th century, where, they want, where there were constant objections to elections, much worse than in union politi student politics. Um, and, um, and so they brought this rule in of a 12-month limit in order to create electoral certainty. Otherwise, the, the poor MPs would spend their whole lives as MPs, uh, constantly worried that somebody was going to challenge their uh, legitimacy. Um, so you've got the 12-month rule. But um, so if, if there is to be a prosecution, it's got to be done by uh, May the 7th and um, uh, the anniversary of the uh, general election. It, it is quite... I think there, is, there must be uh, probably a 25% you know, chance that the, the result will be overturned because the Conservatives officially spent only £187 below the limit. We think they spent at least £25,000 above the limit. Um, and um, so that if, if the, that would then mean, if it was overturned, the 
uh, and uh, they were prosecuted, and the candidate and his agent would be disqualified, Craig McKinley, and so there would have to be uh, a rerun. Whether it counts as a by-election or whether it counts as a, as a, technically as a rerun of the general election, I don't actually know, but it's important because if it was a by-election, then the spending limit suddenly becomes 100,000. Um, and um, whereas if it's a rerun, then you stick with the 15,000 limit. And that's quite an important principle there because otherwise, uh, suddenly the Conservatives are, are allowed to spend what they were spending, um, whereas, uh, and therefore it would seem to be a little bit unfair on, on the other parties in those circumstances. But, I mean, the way the, the, way the world works... Uh, generally, people sort of turn a blind eye and let people off in, 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 in that area of politics. So I suspect there won't be a rerun, but I wouldn't rule it out. And we have a question here just at the front. Yeah. Going back to PPE and politicians, modern, the modern public seems to be rather disinterested in politicians and seems to be rather proud of the fact that they're not interested. Do you think perhaps we should be encouraging politicians to first of all go into business, become self-employed, go into the corporate world, each for say two years or three years, go into the armed forces for two to three years, go and work in the NHS for two to three years, teachers for two to three years, and basically make that a sort of requirement for the majority of politicians to do before they actually become politicians. Would that help? I think it would be a lot more healthy, and I think um, uh, the... Uh, and, and I think, actually, nearly most politicians have got that kind of background. I mean, not the, there are not that many army people with army background. I mean, not, you know, during the, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there were a lot of MPs who'd fought in the, in the Second World War uh, or had done national service um, and so had that kind of uh, background. And people tended to get into the House a little bit later. Um, and there were a lot of people who'd come from the trade unions on the Labour side and done done proper manual jobs. Hardly anybody in Parliament now has done a, what you would regard as a, a traditional working class job um, involving their hands. Um, and, um, but I think that the, the fact that our, the sort of our leaders are people who've done PP here at Oxford and then become special advisors uh, and then gone to Westminster and immediately become the PPS to a minister and gone up the ministerial ladder, you know, the Ed Miliband, the David Miliband, the Ed Balls, Clegg, Cameron, Osborne. Actually, they're, they're not typical. Uh, most MPs have done a lot. And actually, I think one of the refreshing things about the intake of 2015, particularly on the Conservative side, actually, is the number of different backgrounds they have come from um, and the variety of backgrounds. And a lot of them have done business, uh, have come from business backgrounds. There's a lot fewer lawyers than there used to be, surprisingly. I mean, the, uh, everybody... You know, for a long time, everybody used to go on about how there were far too many lawyers in the House of Commons. If anything, there aren't enough lawyers in the House of Commons these days, and, and governments and oppositions find it difficult to um, uh, find enough people to fill the law officer jobs, as we've seen with uh, Jeremy Wright, the new Attorney General, and Robert Buckland, his deputy. They must be the most inexperienced people to hold those office, uh, offices in, 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 in uh, British history. Um, and so... Uh, I, I think, uh, I think your pr the principle is right. I think, it, I think it's a matter of encouragement. I think it would be wrong to lay down rules on this. Um, and, and in any case, people would just sort of get around the rules. So they'd go off and do their, you know, their two years in industry almost on sufferance, you know, a bit like people used to do national service. Uh, and it wouldn't be genuine. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we just, we, ha we have to, um, uh, we have to, uh, uh, to try and force it and change the rules and so on would be, would be wrong. I think the, the, other, the other trend that I, uh, I abhor, actually, in British politics, uh, and I'm very unfashionable for saying this, is this obsession with candidates being local. Um, I mean, you know, the, the advantages of a candidate being local are minor, uh, and the disadvantages are huge. And what you see in the Labour Party now is again and again and again, Labour candidates are people who've been deputy leader of the council for 10 years, or leader of the council for 10 years. Um, and on the whole, there are local government leaders do not make good national politicians in this country. It's not true in France, it's not true in America. But in this country, uh, we as an, we, we would, you, you would struggle to name, him, since the war, more than six successful local government leaders who've then become successful national politicians. Uh, and, this, uh, and this is part of this obsession with being local, um, and part of the, and I'm afraid that the, the process whereby you've devolved the selection to local party memberships 
has made it easier for the, the big local political leader to secure election amongst a, a tiny number of, of, of party members. But I think it's, it's harming the quality of uh, MPs, and they aren't just MPs, but it's the pool from which uh, ministerial office holders are taken. So that is... Uh, so that, 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 that does worry me, um, particularly on the Labour side, where you know, virtually every MP these days on the Labour side seems to have a local government background. Um, and, but there was that trend in the conser among the Conservatives as well. But there were a lot of, lot of interesting people elected at the, uh, at, at, at the election, you know, journalists, musicians. Um, um, and um, so, um, yeah, sorry, I rabbited on too well. You yeah. Yeah. That's a sort of public image of the politician. Yeah. You have control of the completely different situation, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. You have to go after them. Yeah. I think the other thing is actually that the people who go the route of um, uh, becoming special advisors in Whitehall, in the Treasury, the big departments, are having had a good university career, they're actually they actually um, they may ha they may lack experience, but they're they're pretty bright. And I think um, you've got to bear that in mind as well. We, de we do actually want to have quite a lot of clever ministers around. They don't all have to be clever. Um, but um, I, I think I, I prefer to have my, hand, my, um, uh, my, my government in the hands of uh, inexperienced, clever people uh, than experienced, stupid people. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally, you'll have a bit of both. Um, and um, uh, so uh, the, 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 uh, I, I think uh, we are in danger of overreacting here. The other thing... If you insist that all your uh, MPs are local, people who are brought up in the constituency where they uh, live, well, that's all very well in American politics because most states elect, a few, elect some Democrats and some Republicans. There are you know, very few states that are exclusively one party or the other. But actually, if you're a conservative brought up in South Wales, well, that rules out a political career for you then, doesn't it, Sunshine? Or if you're a Labour supporter brought up in Surrey, well, you can forget a political career as well. Um, I, I think we have to be a lot more tolerant. And actually... You know, if, if, if somebody's been a candidate in a constituency after six months they, they, and they've been working assiduously, they'll know that their way round and they'll, be, they'll, 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 they'll have picked it up. Uh, I just think that uh, we, are, we, we go overboard about this local thing. I blame the Liberals, actually, because they used to, they used to, you know, whenever they had a, you know, in by-elections and so, whenever they had a candidate, they'd go on and on and on about uh, how, how, it, how local they were. Um, and, um, and then kept very quiet about it when they chose a candidate that wasn't local. And then all the other parties followed. Are there any other questions? Yeah, um, we actually have one over there. Um, when Evan Davis came the other day, he yeah. said that one of the sad things about spin and the effect it's had on politics is that most politicians now are more impressive in private than they are in public. <laughs> I was wondering if you agreed with that and who you would say was most different off the record? <laughs> um, off the record, of course. Well, I might, if I can think of somebody, I, I might well put them on, on the record. Um, certainly, well, I'm not sure Evan's right in saying that this is any different than what it was. Um, and, um, the, uh, uh, and there are... Um, it's... Uh, I think there are some, you know, there are some who, are, uh, who, are, who are extraordinary performers publicly and uh, are, are good in the House of Commons, and, and then behind the scenes they can be... I mean, David Owen, for instance, I remember. Uh, certainly, uh, he, he was deeply unimpressive when you, when you met him, uh, but was you know, a pretty good performer um, nationally. I think it varies, um, I don't, and I don't, I don't think that is a trend. Um, I mean, um, I, so I, I probably disagree with, uh, with Evan there. Certainly there are some politicians who are, who are very different privately to the, to the, to the, the public figure, uh, and there are others that, you know, somebody like Ken Clark, what you see publicly is what you see privately, um, and whereas others uh, will suddenly open up behind the scenes and, uh, and be very, uh, you know, um, uh, very careful about what they say uh, when, they're on, uh, when they're on the camera. Generally, the ones who are more confident comfortable within their skin. So Boris Johnson and Ken Clark are pretty much the same privately 
uh, as they are um, uh, publicly. Theresa May doesn't open up publicly and doesn't open up privately. Um, and um, I think, actually, I prefer the ones who are consistent between their public persona uh, and their private persona. But I, I think I would disagree with Evan that that's a trend. I think that's always been the case. But I've been covering politics a slightly longer than Evan, and economics is his <laughs> thing, really. Um, <laughs> Um, are there any final questions? I mean, the other thing is that are, there are some politicians who are, uh, I mean, Ed, who um, have a much worse public image than their private image. I mean, Ed Balls, for instance, I've always found charming privately uh, and comes across as a bit of a bully publicly. <laughs> um, whereas Jim Callaghan was the other way around. He came across as, you know, Uncle Jim and, and all of that and, you know, genial and everything. And he was a right bastard in private. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, I suppose, the, the, ideally, I mean, that's why Jim Callaghan became uh, party leader and prime minister and Ed Balls, uh, Ed Balls didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, Arthur Scargill was, uh, although he's not strictly a politician, but he is in a way. I mean, Scargill is, um, I mean, Scargill's uh, become a bit eccentric in his old age, shall we say. Uh, but in, in his heyday, Scargill was, uh, you know, a frightening, um, uh, you know, uh, figure, I think. Private, uh, publicly, uh, but was absolute delight uh, uh, privately and behind the scenes and uh, in incredibly easy to get on with. Uh, and we had a question just at the back, just there. Hi, I was wondering if you had any views on the Women's Equality Party? Um, not really. I've not really had an, anything to do with them apart from uh, that's the... Um, Gosh, my, I'm now having a, a, a moment of, uh, of forgetfulness. Um, the, um, the comedian uh, who's Danish. Uh, sorry? Andy Toxic. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes I, 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 I chatted to her a bit, a bit about it. Um, I'm, um, I mean, it strikes me that the trouble is this, in this country um, is that it's difficult for uh, uh, small parties to emerge. On the other hand, uh, the last 10 years have made it a lot easier for small parties to emerge um, in that we, let's, be, let's face it, we actually have PR in most elections in this country. It's one of the, uh, the great secrets, actually. We don't have them for the ones that, the really big elections that matter for Westminster uh, and for local government in England, but we have PR for the Greater London Assembly, the European elections, the Scottish elections, the Welsh elections, Scottish local government, the Northern Ireland elections, the police commissioner elections, um, mayoral elections, or if they're not PR, they're forms of it. And because there are also a lot more elections, people, as I said earlier, are a lot more promiscuous. So they say, well, I'll vote for, hey, I think I'll give them a go this time, or I'll try the Liberal Democrats or the Greens. Or, and that, of course, has accounted for the rise of all of these smaller parties suddenly in the last five years. Greens, UKIP, the SNP, uh, respect to a degree, and there's one other, I forget, who's just emerged in the last... Um, but... Um, and, uh, the, the, uh, and actually, I think that's all incredibly healthy. Um, but whether the Women's Equality Party will make a breakthrough, I suppose uh, uh, the, 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 the area to do it is the, uh, the European elections, because that's where, uh, of course, the BNP I didn't mention, although they've now gone into uh, almost terminal decline. Um, the, uh, the European elections, because they are, um, uh, and the Scottish and Welsh elections, because they are, uh, pretty proportional. They do give you an opportunity, if you are a pretty small party, to get one or two seats. And then with seats comes uh, extra money and facilities, and your MPs get paid. And what these parties then do is they then rechannel some of the, their MPs' income into the infrastructure. And that's how the Greens have risen, and UKIP has risen, and the SNP uh, and the BNP. And they divert European money in all sorts of ways that they probably shouldn't do. Um, so um, I wouldn't write them off uh, yet, but the, one of the problems that all minor parties have is persuading us broadcasters to cover them, because when we're covering an election, um, I mean, even in the days when it was uh, Labour, Conservative, Liberal Democrat, that was quite hard, because you had to sort of, you were covering a constituency, you had to rush around and, and get to see all three. And now we have to include UKIP. And if we're in Wales, we've got to include Plaid. Or in Scotland, we've got to... So it's getting harder and harder to cover these elections. And, we've got, and also, uh, editors give you less and less time. You know, it was three minutes, now two and a half minutes or whatever. Um, and so it's very, very difficult for small parties to persuade the broadcasters to give them any coverage. And that's what makes the rise of UKIP and the extraordinary rise of the Greens in, in the year leading up to the general election all the more... 
um, surprising and, uh, and commendable, really. Um, so, um, yeah, they, they, may, they may do it. But they haven't really, I haven't really uh, come across my radar that much, I have to say, in the, in the last few months. Since, when, when were they formed? Sometime last year, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, good luck to any new party. So my final question then is just, you know, moving across the Atlantic, the other election oh. which is going on um, is rather interesting. Uh, and a couple of uh, days ago, we held a Democratic primary here in the Cambridge Union uh, for Democratic members living abroad to come and cast their vote. Um, we actually voted for Sanders uh, in the east of England, uh, which seems to be going against the trend uh, over there. Uh, and so this was a primary involving English this was, people? So, yeah. Oh, sorry, everybody. Yeah. Uh, so it's yeah. sort of Democrats living abroad. Yeah. Um, oh, right, so, so it was just Americans. So just Americans, right, yeah. yeah. Uh, but as somebody who's covered uh, an American election in the past, I wondered yeah. if you had any sort of thoughts about or predictions um, about what we're going to see in the next sort of couple of months leading up to the sort of the, 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 the election itself. Well, it does seem to be... I mean, I haven't followed this election as closely as I would have liked to, and as I also, because I am actually a great, a great follower of American politics, and um, I love it, and uh, I love my time there, and I did... A lot of American politics as part of my PPE course. It does seem to now have boiled down to Trump uh, versus Clinton. And I think uh, there must be, you know, probably a 35% chance that Trump will win. I think that what we fail to do in this country, because we're all, uh, you know, I mean, if Trump was up for election here, he'd get, what, 5% of the vote. Uh, it's the same. We always misunderstand the American right. Uh, we misunderstood it with Reagan. We were all astonished when Reagan was elected in 1980. We misunderstood it with George W. Bush. We were all astonished when he was elected in, in 2000. Um, and that's because uh, we are... Sorry? Well, <laughs> all right, even if you say he, 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 you know, uh, that Gore got more votes, he still came pretty close. Um, and we didn't understand why that was. We thought the American people were mad. We don't understand, actually, most of America, because when we go to America, we tend to go to pretty liberal areas, Boston, New York, L.A., San Francisco, Chicago, or whatever. We don't go to the small town, middle of America, uh, where people vote for uh, characters like that. And, um, and so, th th we, we, and, and equally true of our journalists, because uh, uh, and a lot of my, I mean, I, I really got annoyed with some of my journalistic colleagues who said, I can't see an, a, a, how George W. Bush is ever going to get elected. And I say, hang on a moment, you've got to understand, there's a lot of America there uh, that you never go to. Um, and so I think there must be a 35% chance that, that Trump will be elected. I mean, Clinton has got a lot of bag baggage in her past. Um, and we are living in a world where people want authenticity, they want, they want freshness. Um, well, you know, um, and, um, uh, well, Trump, can, it, it, you could argue, is authentic. Um, <laughs> you could argue the other one. But he's certainly, in terms of political terms, fresh, as indeed, of course, is, is um, well, again, arguably, but Sanders, he's certainly a new player on the, uh, uh, on the center stage. And we've seen this extraordinary phenomenon, you know, in the whole of the Western world, really, or most of the Western world. Um, America, this country with Corbyn and Farage and Salmon, and all these new, and, and uh, Nicholas Sturgeon, we haven't, I haven't mentioned at all tonight. Um, uh, all, all new players, all actually very good communicators, um, all pushing aside, uh, and Natalie Bennett, uh, pushing aside the traditional players. And in France, Marine Le Pen, although she's had a bit of a setback recently, and of course, Syriza in uh, Greece and Podemos in, 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 in Spain, and uh, similar parties in, in other countries of left and right. So it's all being shaken up, and I, I just think that it's become so unpredictable now um, that uh, there, there must be a strong possibility that Trump um, uh, will, will get elected in America. I would say one other thing, though. I do think, and, and I say this as a former Washington correspondent, it is outrageous the way in which all of us in broadcasting and the newspapers, in the media, are giving the American elections so much coverage <laughs> I mean, admittedly, it's one of the more in, most interesting elect, American elections of all time, two uh, high-profile characters, high-profile in our terms, that we're familiar with, uh, and a, you know, a huge drama and, and, uh, and, and so on. But we will give the American elections this year and a bit of last year about 100 times more coverage than we will give the French presidential election next year, and after all, that's for five years, not four, uh, or the uh, German chancellorship election, which I think is next year as well. Um, and, uh, and yet, 
surely they are, in terms of the future of this country, certainly in the case of Germany, the leadership of Germany, as we've seen over the last few months, is hugely important uh, when it comes to the future of, of this country. Uh, I think you could justify giving twice as much coverage to the American election, but not, I suspect it's 100 times as much, or 50 times as much, uh, over if you, if, you, if, you, if you measured it by the end of next year. Uh, we've got it all wrong. And of course, it, it, the reason is that you know, we, in, we in the media, we in journalism are in entertainment as well as information, and that's why, and that's why it is. But it, it, it's, um, we've got our values a little bit skewed, I think. Well, I think we'll leave it there, but thank you very much for coming. And on a related note, on Thursday night, we have the final debate of term, uh, which is this House believes the Conservative Party have been unfairly demonised, where our president, James Hutt, will be uh, defending the Conservatives. So do come for that. It will be, I think entertaining will be a word for that. Um, You heard it from James Hutt himself. Andy Burnham is also speaking and arguably more impressive. Uh, but thank you again once for coming. Um, I think everyone will join with me and uh, with a warm round of applause. And thank you for being here.